So in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. That's uh, a well-known saying among scientists and engineers alike. So one might say there is a gap between theory and practice, right? And let's look at the and the theoretical side. We know since crypto last year that masking with D plus one shares, which is the minimum number of shares required uh, for a DETH order secure implementation, we know it's possible also in nonlinear operations. But looking at the practical side of things, no implementation, and specifically for our cards, no must AES implementation has yet been published with D plus one shares. So in this work, we bridge this gap and we provide the smallest must AES implementation. We also verify them for both the first and the second order. And both our implementations use the minimum number of shares, which is D plus one. So how did we go about this? We started uh, by delving in a bit in the theory behind it, the threshold implementations, as we've saw uh, in the earlier talk too. Afterwards, when the implementation is done, we can load them on uh, a target platform, which is uh, FPGAs in our case, and we can proceed with the side channel analysis evaluation. Only then, only when our security claims are satisfied, uh, only then it makes sense to quantify the implementation cost. So that is the outline of this talk. We'll first scratch the surface on uh, threshold implementations a bit. And also, yeah, the previous talk was about TI, so you can already guess it's, it's a rather popular uh, masking scheme. Uh, and it's popular because it offers provable security with minimal assumptions on the hardware. So even if your hardware glitches, uh, security is still provided. It's a Boolean masking scheme based on secret sharing and multi-party computation. Does that mean is if we want to mask a function f with inputs a, uh, b, and output c, the first thing we will do is split, split these. And since we use d plus one shares, I exemplify this on a first order implementation. We get a1, a2, b1, b2. And of course, the basic uh, properties of masking need to satisfy, which are uniform inputs and correctness. Whatever you do in the mass implementation should reflect what is done in the unmasked implementation. Specifically to threshold implementations is the dth order non-completeness. That means if you observe D wires or D subcircuits, uh, you should not be able to observe all D plus one values. This is where the security uh, in the glitchy setting really comes from. Then finally, so we focus here on AES, which is a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a block cipher, it has rounds. If we, do, if we send our uh, masked values through uh, a nonlinear operation, this uniformity in, of the inputs at the next round will not be satisfied. That's why we will add fresh random values to our outputs. And this, uh, so yeah, we will add fresh random values and then clock these outputs into registers. Otherwise, early propagation might deteriorate our, uh, our security. So the number of outputs is immediately related to the number of output registers we have and to the fresh random values we need. That's important for later. One extra condition uh, we need to inherit here from uh, the consolidated masking schemes paper is uh, that the input shares need to be independent. And the best way to explain this is uh, by looking at what would go wrong if they are dependent. So let's take A1 equal to B1, A2 equal to B2. And what happens then is that observing F1, so observing one sub function, we have both A1 coming there and B2 coming there. B2 equaling A2, we have enough information to unmask our secret value A. And so our security would be broken. So this, these input shares really need to be independent. If we want to apply this to the advanced encryption standard now, the first thing we will do is, uh, is we will mask the linear functions or in the affine functions. And since we use Boolean masking, this is rather easy to do. We just have to assign one of those operations to one input shared. And there's a function I'm sure you're all really, really uh, accustomed to it. It's called copy paste. That's the really easy thing. Things get a bit messy when we want to mask uh, the, the, the nonlinear operations, though, the S-box or sub-bytes operation. And this is what we get. This is uh, the diagram of our second order mass implementation. 
I will not detail this. Instead, I will detail the first order implementation. And I'm sure you will enjoy reading this uh, in our paper. So in most implementations, uh, the CanWrite SBox has been shown to be a good starting point for uh, implementations. And previous work has shown that based on how we implement uh, these subcomponents, so we could take them together uh, in a Gala field 16 inverter, or we could mask the subfunctions here, the subfield functions in Gala field 4. Based on the choice we make there, we get more efficient and more, or more compact implementations. That leaves us to a choice, and we need to justify that choice. And as I said earlier, the number of output shares we have immediately influences the number of randomness we require and the number of output registers, so it's also related to the area. If we want to share the Gala field 16 inverter in one go, which has been shown to be more efficient in the previous work, we would require the cube of d plus 1 output shares. If we would mask the square, uh, the multiplier instead, which has algebraic degree 2, requiring the square of d plus 1 output shares, we have uh, less cost on the randomness and the area. That's why we choose to only uh, mask the multipliers here. And this is how we would partition our design. Next, since we require uh, the uniformity of inputs in every stage here. As I said earlier, we need to clock in every of these values uh, into registers. We will also mask there after every, every of that stage. And to satisfy the independent uh, inputs here, we need to make sure we put a register immediately after the linear map. The mask refreshing is generically done using a ring refreshing scheme, which means we use an equal number of random units as we have output shares. But for the first order, we, do not need uni uh, we only need univariate security. That means we, only, we do not allow the attacker to combine points in time across uh, clock cycles. And that is why we can get away with using one unit of randomness less here. Another trick we use to further reduce the area, so we not only uh, go from three-share implementation to a two-share implementation for first-order security, we also add the contribution of this square scalar function here before the register, allowing us to save some space there. Now our implementation is, is, is done, everything is coded, we load it on our FPGAs and we pr proceed with the side channel evaluation. So for that we use uh, an evaluation board with very low noise. And we like to use low noise here because the lower the noise, the faster you would see leakage in your masking scheme. So that means if we have no leakages and high number of traces, that means we can be really confident that we have achieved the security we want. We have a lot of fresh random masks uh, to, to achieve our security. And we need to generate them somewhere, and we chose to generate them together with a, with a cryptographic algorithm, with, with AES. But in order to not uh, increase the noise, we choose to alternate every clock cycle of AES with every clock cycle of the random number generator. Just as a side note, for the random number generator, we use uh, the three innermost function of prints, and based on how much bits we need, we uh, instantiate some of these uh, in parallel. And from these figures, you can see that when the PRNG is off, there's minimal activity uh, in between the AES clock cycles. And when we turn it on, those peaks rise. And uh, yeah, the separation there is clearly visible. We also check that in uh, the critical path, there's no overlap. Now, leakage detection itself. Uh, so in the state of the art, we use uh, TVLA. And very roughly, it goes as follows. We would take a, uh, several, we will take a lot of traces and group them into, into two sets. One set corresponding to a fixed but masked input, and we choose zero for that, the zero plain text. The other uh, set corresponding to a random uh, input value. Once we acquired all these traces, we take the mean and we take the difference of that mean, and that means if in the first order, if we have no difference of mean, so if this uh, statistic here falls between our confidence level of 
4.5 minus 4.5, we can be confident that the security is achieved, that there's no difference in the first statistical order between our two groups. When we apply this now on our uh, implementation, we first apply it when our masks are off. And what we see here is this is just a sanity check. What we see here is we have clear leakage, both in the first order and the second order. But that's to be expected since we did, don't, do not refresh and our masking scheme is not working properly. If we now turn on the random number generator, and that's the only thing we do uh, in our next experiments, all increase in side channel resistance comes directly from using our proper masking scheme. And that's what we get here. For our first order implementation, with 100 million traces, we see no leaks. Everything falls nicely between our confidence uh, interval. Since we only use D plus one shares, which is a theoretical minimum number of shares, we observe high leakages in the second order. Now we can do the same for a second order implementation. And again, we see we have, uh, when our PRG is turned off, we have first order, second order, and third order leakage, perfectly expectable. Turning on the uh, PRNG, everything falls nicely within the confidence threshold uh, for both the first order and the second order uh, uh, t-test. Clear uh, leakages in the third order can again be, be observed. For the second order though, we also need to combine points in time. Uh, the bivariate attack we perform here is uh, on one execution of the S-Box itself. So in time we combine points and we process them using centered products and we calculate the t-test on that. With PRNG off, what we see is clear leakages uh, corresponding to our implementation. Turning the PRNG on now, we see that all leakages disappear and for the ones that are in need of coffee, the scale here changed. So everything falls nicely between four, uh, below 4.5, this is the absolute value, and our implementation is deemed secure. We can now proceed with uh, the assessment of our implementation costs. And going from an unmasked implementation, uh, the previous work, uh, the first order must AES would scale this uh, up to three times, roughly. Now we have reduced that with 10% uh, for the first order, and with around 30% for the second order. So especially in the second order, we see a good in, uh, decrease in area. Most of this area comes from the uh, S-Box itself, since in linear parts, D plus one were already used uh, in the previous work. So we have a decrease of 20% uh, for our first order S-Box, and a decrease of 50% for a second order S-Box, which is, uh, yeah, a, a good, a significant uh, improvement. When we look at uh, the number of clock cycles, there's only a, sim uh, a, a really small increase in number of clock cycles to achieve our security. So going from the first order, we have an increase of 10%. For the second order, it stays constant. Small disclaimer there, the previous second order implementation could have been made smaller uh, and could have been made uh, with the same number of clock cycles as the first order implementation here. The drawback of our work is that more randomness is consumed, and we have an increase of 70% in randomness for the first order, and this becomes only 30% for the second order. So this is something that will be interesting to investigate. To conclude here, we went from theory to practice, and we realized the smallest uh, MOST AES to date, and we verified it for the first order security and the second order security both with D plus one shares. And as an engineer, it's always fun to know that there's another gap ahead. And for that gap, for that future work, we could look at higher orders. But more interestingly, we could look at how to reduce the consumed randomness in our smallest must implementation. Thank you for your attention.